Good evening. I'm Rick Ford. This evening I would ask you all to step back in time with me over 50 years to 1958, a year in which Britain beat America to the first scheduled transatlantic passenger jet service with a Comet 4. Rolls-Royce engines, of course. A year with a fine summer. Down in Hampshire, this chap was making the most of the weather and gaining brownie points with his new wife by collecting bedding straw for her ponies. For this task he was using a wartime Willis Jeep. So you may guess he enjoyed older vehicles. And you would be correct. For this rural spot was the Jack o' Lantern on the main road from London to Bournemouth, the A31. The cheery chap, none other than Fairfax Guy Wade Palmer. A pilot in the Royal Air Force during World War II, he continued flying after the war and by 1950 was chief flying instructor for the Wiltshire School of Flying at Thruxton. His hobby was indeed old cars and these, scattered in various Nissan huts around the airfield, included a silver ghost with cunard body. For servicing in spares, he went south of Salisbury to one Daniel Richmond at Downton. Daniel, a wild character, specialised in older and competition models and had a penchant for Rolls-Royce products. Amassing spares, tools and instruction books aplenty. At this time, the BMC A-Series engine was announced and at 803 cc's produced only 28 brake horsepower at 4,500 RPM. It was fitted to the A30 and Morris Minor. Daniel, curious as ever, experimented, and the Hampshire-Wiltshire borders were suddenly filled with little family saloons, progressing at quite indecent speeds. Daniel's wife Bunty, a formidable lady, but with very sharp business brain, smelt money, and badgered her husband to forgo the time-consuming old cars and concentrate on this new source of cash. Along came that brainchild of Alec Isigonis, the Mini, which became an icon of the swinging 60s. Customers aplenty, many wanting more performance. Daniel could supply it. He was summoned by Isigonis to Longbridge and in turn Alec visited Downton where Daniel introduced him to leisurely liquid lunches at the Bull and afterwards fly fishing on the Hampshire Avon. Alec was entranced and for Daniel a lucrative consultancy at BMC followed. So Bunty had been correct and even her mood lightened. Daniel asked Wade Palmer if he would be interested in taking over the Rolls-Royce spares, tools and literature. Out of these disparate events was born the Jack-o'-lantern. To learn more, let us accompany a casual visitor to the 11 acres on the edge of the New Forest. There follows a tale, fictional but based upon fact, of this unlikely rural garage. It was late in the afternoon on a Friday, a dreary winter's day in late 1958. Fleeing London, we headed for our flat in Bournemouth. The premature dusk was upon us as climbing away from Rumsey on the main A31 to the coast, we came upon the Regent filling station that sat to the north of the road. I needed no petrol, but the line of cars, hiding in the shadows cast by the meagre forecourt lighting, set my pulse racing. I slowed, halted, and standing in the open Bentley, used my Leica 3B to record the scene. Now, Adox KB17 film gives a 20th at 3.5. Wow, very steady now. Oh, do come along, dear. We'll be late for the theatre. I obeyed. It wasn't until early in the new year that Bournemouth, with its paddle steamers from the pier and yellow trolley buses in the town, called again. This time we set off early, and clearing the A30 black spots of Egham and Bagshot, we skirted Basingstoke, saluting Jimmy Skinner's bypass carriage with a blast on the klaxon. Another bypass at Winchester, a dual carriageway no less, 
then beer brewing, hop smelling Rumsey, and the River Test. Crossing this over steep Mainstone Bridge, we could see Broadlands, the home of Lord Mountbatten, lying to the south. Steeply out of the valley, when interview came the whimsically named Jack O' Lantern. This time, broking no argument, I swung into the gravel forecourt. The lineup of cars was different, but only slightly less imposing. I helped down my most reluctant good lady, and spotting the restaurant sign, led her to the door and suggested she ordered toasted tea cakes and a pot of tea for us both whilst I explored. In fugitive mode, I scuttled through the lich gate to the garden. What a sight in the afternoon sunshine. Two lovely ladies of the restaurant staff relaxing before the lascivious gaze of a caddish K2 Allard. The piece was shattered, however, by a stentorian bellow in a very London accent. Get in here, you two! we got a proper lady customer who wants tea cakes. The indomitable Mrs Bates, bombed out of London in the war, ruled supreme in the kitchen. I turned back to the car, smiling, suddenly in a good mood. The long-snouted Daimler smelt of gas oil, diesel, but had a Barker drophead body with wire wheels and a fine Lucas lighting set, all very undaimler. Avoiding the loutish Allard, I inspected its one-and-a-half-seater neighbour, a six-cylinder overhead cam supercharged sprint car bearing incongruously the road-going registration RC450. Smug in the knowledge of its superior speed, it feared not the towering presence of a four-and-a-half-litre high-chassis Invicta, a dandy with fine flared wings that strutted its stuff alongside. Appropriately upmarket, this was a Cadogan body, Standing guard over this motley collection, as if a drill corporal with a bunch of National Service raw recruits, a diminutive Morris 8 two-door saloon, boasting a one local owner provenance and an unshakable conviction in the established order of things, learned from its ex-serviceman owner. Reeling slightly, I turned and saw a chap with a roddy camera on a tripod recording a very sporting Rolls Phantom II by the fish pond. This stopped with fine carp, apparently poached from Lord Mountbatten's Broadlands estate by Mrs Bates' son, Colin. But, Mum, there's only six. His lordship's got hundreds down there. You'll never notice. I like to think this Phantom too chose this setting for the photograph because its very original paint in 1930 was made translucent, slightly reflective effect by incorporating fish scales in the paint. It won its class at Concorde d'Elegance in Biarritz in 1930. Behind the photographer, waiting patiently, unlike Naomi, his next model, clothed by a little-known short-lived designer, this late 20 horsepower had attractive scuttle windscreen treatment and highly individual interior appointments. Leaving this activity, I rounded the bungalow and encountered two very prim 20 horsepower ladies sheltering in the lee of the building. I was informed sharply by the first that she had starred with Danny Kay in the film Me and the Colonel. The other warned me of the drab, grey-clad Alvis Charlesworth Speed 20 hiding in the corner. We think he's from MI5, something to do with America and a Mr McCarthy. These two early 20 horsepower cars were dwarfed by their neighbour, an elephantine Daimler 35120 Double six, sleeve valve Hooper limousine, trailing a line of more Rolls Royces awaiting workshop space. Hearing the thud of a generator for the 110 volts DC that I hoped had toasted the tea cakes, I made my way past this much more convivial selection seen against the bank of prize azaleas about to bloom. I headed for the five bar gate by a wooden chalet, home to good Mrs. Bates and green-fingered husband, Edward, witnessed the fine magnolia tree. Standing guard, a Dennis commercial, devoid of its body, but still proudly displaying its fleet number of 260. Across the garden, another Dennis was more mobile, piloted by Wade Palmer, and giving Sheila her first experience of vintage of vibrations. 
looking on in disapproval, is Mrs Bates' son, Carp Catching Colin. From this tranquillity, past the chalet, beyond the gate, into the gloom, a more workaday world was found. The Bates' chicken run with scratching hens was sheltered by a sad, vandalised Continental Phantom II upon logs. Not a shred of glass remained, and the offside showed more signs of gunshot activity. Other Rolls-Royce cars around in the wood were in various stages of dismemberment, yielding valuable spares, no doubt, for the vast adjacent shed contained dozens of Rolls-Royce engines and gearboxes. Other eggs from other chicken, perhaps. In this woodland world also, an ex-GPO Morris commercial of 1926, included without apology as it sets the slightly unreal atmosphere of this strange collection. In contrast, the workshop yard was very much an industrial area, a sea of automobiles, attention-grabbing wrecks, a case tractor with a rod through the crankcase, a 1910 Humber front half with unlikely history, a remarkable homemade body on a very early Rolls 2025, once owned by Sir Henry Seagrave. This, unfortunately, also with a protruding Conrod. A very early Rolls-Royce 20 horsepower with Undertaker's van body. This anonymous dark blue and black, silent running nocturnal non-entity had collected the recently departed from their final homes, bound for the Chapel of Rest, but only after dark, so as not to disturb the sensibilities of the residents in the cathedral calm of Winchester. Turning, I was confronted by a lofty Phantom One on axle stands in the middle of the yard. Making my way over to it, I realised a stepladder would have been appropriate. The drophead body had been increased in height with extensions in the bronze windscreen pillars. In so doing, the park ward body became a fixed head, very striking all the same. The main workshop was closed, perhaps to deter visitors such as I, for much activity could be heard from within. Outside, a beautifully rebuilt blower 4.5 W.O. Bentley chassis sat with its Van den Plaar long wing body nearby. A reunion seemed imminent, given its priority position by the doors, but for the viewer, a sneak preview. Spotting the doors of the smaller workshop were ajar, I looked in. A Fraser Nash BMW 328 with much crumpled front end. Near treadless tyres, perhaps a contributory cause. The thumping of the generator reminded me of now cold tea and equally frosty reception, no doubt, awaiting me. I turned to head up the gravel forecourt, but a row of sad, forlorn ghosts like elderly patients in a surgery waiting room, awaiting their turn with the doctor, were lining the roadside hedge. A startling sight. I wanted to look closer, but tore myself away and hurried towards the main building, growing even more aware of my likely reception. In a moment of inspiration, I paused at the Bentley and erected the hood. I entered the restaurant. Nemesis was sitting, ram rod straight, in a fireside chair, and snorted, Ah, at last, hurry up, I've eaten your tea cake, your tea is cold, and I want the hood up. The door banged behind her. That's all right, sir, I could get you a fresh pot, said the waitress I'd seen earlier. Thanking her, I declined, and paid the bill. I swear she winked at me, as I said, keep the change. Leaving this remarkable place, I swung the Speed 6 towards the New Forest and Bournemouth. I concentrated, throttled back, for here the cattle, ponies, donkeys and pigs roamed free, roads unfenced. Even Lindhurst High Street had animals gathered in mutual fly-swatting groups. London seemed a world apart. Back at the Jack-o'-Lantern, Wade Palmer and his family enjoyed the facilities.
Darby Bentley, B-A-T-C-R, was the first resident, and from this humble beginning in idyllic surroundings grew a substantial collection, which I feel has contributed much to the cars which today are owned and treasured by many club members. You recall the sad Continental Phantom II, 22 PY, by Mrs. Bates' Chicken Run. Now it is fully restored and proudly displayed in European shows. At one such in Paris, but way back in 1924, Windovers displayed a striking cabriolet silver ghost in flame orange with polished aluminium bonnet and wheel discs. The motor reported this very striking car as a tribute to British coach building and to Windovers in particular. By 1959, it was naught but a vast tarpaulin covered shape in a tiny back garden of an end of terrace house in Ponder's End. Spotted by Jeremy Bacon from a passing train, he told us we managed to purchase it. Richard Hoppet, the owner, had been chauffeur for Lady Mary Cartwright. Upon the outbreak of World War II, 7 AU was gifted to Dick, complete with a hackney carriage plate. For Dick was an invalid and unfit for further service in HM forces. Now, Dick, recognising that Tempus Fugit, decided to bid farewell to his old friend. After a long day, a chum and I had managed to extricate it. First, the fence. We used our trusty Land Rover with stout rope and also to tow 7AU back to Hampshire via the North Circular in rush hour. Very interesting and very good training for young Brian who was at the end of the rope. Galling, however, when it went to its new owner, it was collected on a low loader, the very first from the jack-o'-lantern. Notice the spare set of more flowing front wings in the ghost. Now well restored, it features on the cover of the History of Windovers by Jane Windover, sporting those replacement wings. Non-original may be, but period and quite splendid. The first ghost at the Jack came from the Bertram Cowan garage in Streatham as a garage breakdown truck. Wade and I went up with cash and bought both 89RM and its crane. Unusual, for in those days a good hoist was equal in value to a silver ghost. Driving this back to Hampshire, it became evident the chassis was a very good taut example and we now learn from Steve Hubbard it had been returned to the factory in 1936 to have a full overhaul and Andre telecontrol shock absorbers fitted. It did not have, however, the front wheel brake upgrade, so remained braked on the rear only. Sir Harry, newly knighted, obviously went on the spend. In addition to 89RM as a formal town carriage, he had Hooper, built a rakish two-seat tourer on GH58, an early 20 horsepower. Also, non-front-wheel brakes. Perhaps he mistrusted them. At this time, in this he was not alone. 89RM remained with us for all our days at the main road garage, performing sterling service. Here, Wade Palmer poses with the latest captive. When the A31 became a dual carriageway, the business moved down into Rumsey to a redundant jam factory. Threepence on returned jars. Here was space for the cars, but storing a period bus body was more tricky. This had operated in the New Forest between Lyndhurst and the railway station on a Ford commercial chassis. 89RM's use as a breakdown was no longer Hmm, yes we did. Here, in the early stages, at the Jam Factory, with Hampshire registration CR6662 and complete with hackney carriage plate for 14 passengers. Room for all 14. Amazingly, the only modification was the swapping of the front side panels side for side to accommodate the Silver Ghost side levers. A view from the bridge. 
The new bulkhead was made by a local chippy using an African hardwood. Upon completion, I gave this bus a run out to go to the 1964 meeting at Goodwood. I don't know if any of you remember seeing it there. But it eventually went to Bunty Scott Moncrief, and it was at this stage that it started to gain its fanciful histories. Typical was that after being pensioned off from a career on a vast sporting estate in wildest Scotland, it was used as the local hotel's bus, ferrying guests from the railway station. Bunty obviously thought this more romantic than Lyndhurst and the New Forest. Another noteworthy restoration, this by Colin Laybord, a club member, was 74 A6. The early 20 horsepower commercial cadaver conveyance you saw earlier. A most original chassis, notice correctly black painted lamps and shutters and the beveled edge radiator. The solution came with a pretty fixed head body from a period Daimler fitted to the 20 horsepower in Collins carpeted workshop. A praiseworthy effort. Another fixed head coupe is seen here collecting the children from boarding school for the holidays. What would Elf and Safety and all the police of today have to say about this? The finely sculpted front wings suggest a sporting chariot. And so indeed was 34 PE. Originally a tourer for the Duke of Sutherland on an Alpine Eagle high speed chassis. This body, although bearing Litchfield plates, looks later and the whole ensemble was said to have formed the tractor unit for an articulated horse box. Its owner was Noel Mavro Gordato, seen here with Wade Palmer filling his ghost. Mavro was an early aviator and motorcycle racer before retiring to Salisbury to run a retail motorcycle business, then on to run a heather farm in the New Forest. Here, many inline Henderson machines shared lodgings with his 1914 Grand Prix Opel. Mavro eventually gave way to family needs and we found him 203 RY, a fine drophead by Freestone and Webb, which we collected from Sussex on a fine summer's day. 34 PE was part of the deal. This was rebodied by Chris Martin in Basingstoke to strict instructions, photos and drawings from the War Office for John Box, art director of a forthcoming film. So 34 PE found itself in many exotic locations, with splendid crowds to welcome it, even, on one occasion, a guard of honour. General Salute Prison Arms! He's got the bit between his teeth all right. Cocky. In the film industry, all is carefully arranged. But behind the camera, it is a different world. In the foreground, Anthony Quayle and Howard Marion Crawford with Freddie Young, the ace director of photography. Here, 34PE is rigged as camera car with David Lean standing and on the running board, Freddie Young. Behind is the very sophisticated mobile camera lorry with dedicated crew, flown over from Texas. However, David Lean, a Rolls-Royce owner, had faith in 34PE and myself. Adjusting ignition, mixture and using the governor carefully, I provided a sufficiently steady camera platform for this final shot of the film to be in the can.
Now the more questioning of the audience will be answered. A ghost mascot would have obscured this shot. Not so the early 20 horsepower one I used throughout the filming. The motorcycle was one of five I took out. Two each Douglas and Triumph solar machines. Here is one with myself as intrepid rider, carefully placed over an essential prop for the Cairo street scene. The fifth was a splendid BSA V-twin combination, in the background here at the Officers Club, whilst 34 PE receives some basic servicing and a solo leans on the wall in the foreground. A scene of tranquillity and peace. But the other ghosts we supplied had no such luck. You can see why we elected to use front wheel brake chassis. Another spectacular wrecking scene was the derailment of a passenger train. Here, the locomotive travelling at speed was toppled sideways off an embankment onto a carefully designed concrete bed hidden beneath the sand. The locomotive skidded forward on its side, dragging the first coaches after it, leading to the spectacular looting scenes. This looting has got to stop. It is customary. It's theft. And theft makes feed. The attention to detail and solidness of construction led to the armoured cars being used in the film for much set dressing. This scene ends with Lawrence climbing aboard, rapping on the turret, and I pull away from the camera. Here Lawrence is questioned by the American journalist Bentley. Even the underbonnet details appealing to the filmmakers. Bentley is again accompanied by an armoured car but this time above the port of Aqaba, actually a carefully constructed set on the Spanish coast north of Almeria. But all of this a far cry from eastern Southampton, where this ghost languished as a woody before being rescued by Wade Palmer, seen here freeing off the brakes. The construction of these dramatic beasts was well covered by the local press. After their adventures, both armoured cars were returned to Rumsey, stripped of their armaments. We in the place mounted the women. You will all be relieved to hear that more rebodying on both chassis by Jarvis, I think, produced Tourers, 68 RM, seen here at Goodwood, and 82 EM in more continental climes. After all their travels, these two ended up, in 2009, less than 40 miles apart in Scotland. Meanwhile, 34 PE returned, and I collected this from London docks, drove it to Rumsey, and into the hands of a grocer from Glastonbury, a Mr Hibbard, who derived much enjoyment from showing it in its full desert livery at local shows and events. Here, the showing of the film Lawrence of Arabia at Glastonbury. 34 PE is now in the hands of his nephew, Roger Kettle, who is an equally appreciative owner. A change of scene, a drab north country town, a Tock H hostel with mythical lantern high on the wall, and before it, an ex breakdown truck. This is 18 NE to become the second Lawrence of Arabia tourer with similar body by Chris Martin. Here, Wade Palmer Jr. is in charge. The differences were minor, mainly windscreen and dashboard, but this chassis never left these shores and was held in reserve for 34 PE, 
At the conclusion of filming, the new owner of 18NE therefore had a rebuilt Silver Ghost with new engine, rebuilt beaded edge wheels and a new body. But he didn't like the body. Wade Palmer found a Sunbeam Tourer by Maythorn of the period and the two were combined to produce this. We provided cars for other films, the first of which was the Green Gage Summer in 1960. Here B3HM has Kenneth Moore and Susanna York aboard with the flame hair of backseat Jane Asher against the Champagne Pomery headquarters in Reims. More glamour with the elegant forms of 74MY and its chauffeurs here at the Jack-o'-lantern directly after returning from Turkey. I took it almost immediately to Paris for the remake of The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, directed by Vincente Minelli. Our hotel was just off the Etoile, so each day I negotiated central Parisian traffic. But this magnificent beast on Istanbul plates, corps diplomatique to the rear, and siren wailing, parted the traffic in true biblical fashion. All very unseemly, but in mitigation I was only 23 at the time. Let the following tale be a warning to club members attracted by lucrative offers and thinking of letting their treasured car into the film world. On the film set, ten miles out of town, many indignities were heaped upon 74MY. The fixed sedanka top posed lighting and camera angle problems, so a wooden platform was needed to carry lights, tripod, camera and crew. I insisted on wooden blocks between axles and chassis and personally fitted them. Alas, this first attempt using scaffolding poles was too springy, so a more substantial, very heavy wooden structure was made. However, the filming was getting so far behind schedule with costs escalating that the whole unit was shipped out to California including 74MY. Wade Palmer negotiating the sale to MGM from a very strong position. You'll be pleased to know 74MY is now back in the United Kingdom. But enough of movie land. Consider now early coachwork modifications of a more minor nature. Here at Station Garage Taplow in leafy Buckinghamshire, 98PY, another Phantom 2, tatty in faded dull red, the body was by Barker. Considered too sad to grace Commander Keller's showroom of Padden Brothers in Knightsbridge, it was sent, as was the habit, to Peter Farmerlow at Station Garage. We bought it, and upon driving it back to Rumsey, I was struck by the aluminium dash and plated windscreen surround, while the horn ring was a commercially available item, very occasionally fitted by coach builders to customer order. Upon arrival in Rumsey, I noticed the frameless side windows front and rear and slightly over large rear window. It was offered for sale, but no interest was shown, so it was taken on by our senior fitter, Martin Ashby, ex Thornycroft. He repainted it in a striking claret and black and used it daily, a habit he retains to this day, maintaining a stable of fine cars, all driven regularly. It wasn't until 98PY came into the hands of Swiss club member Matty Schumacher that the coachwork was returned to its original full drophead splendour. Stepping back to an earlier Phantom II, 29GY sported a Hooper Fallight body with a splendid roof line setting off the hole. Again, frameless door glass, but this time front doors only and this prompted a subsequent owner to revert to original Sedanka style. One resident that I do hope has been restored is the Phantom 1 fixed head coupe you saw on axle stands in the workshop yard. This a most imposing vehicle on the road we collected from a farm at Abbots Barton Heading for Rumsey, but still well within the 30 limit of Winchester, Wade Palmer intimidates a humble Ford Popular, 
seemingly unaware of the police constable cycling ahead. This burst of power from a long stored farm find produced a remarkable cloud of dust, rust, straw and more in its wake. Forsaking the spirit of ecstasy for the winged bee, here is a standard park ward three and a half, but somehow much more glamorous. The car, which seemed to have spent much of its life on the continent, gained a smarter appearance by virtue of new, very shapely wings. Bearing Van Voren nameplates, it has a late Bedfordshire registration, LRO331. Anyone who can identify this car by chassis number, please contact me. Backwards again to another Hooper, 1924 Silver Ghost 36EM, a full cabriolet for the 12th Earl of Derby. Bought from a brusque Yorkshire market trader, the car, complete with tatty, is seen here upon arrival. Sold to an American working in Crawley, Sussex, who had it restored well albeit in tune-toned grey. A later club member, owner, lowered the radiator and modified the scuttle accordingly. The brusque Bradford trader, once the deal was done, mentioned he knew of another ghost abandoned in a derelict mill yard. Upon persuasion being applied, reluctantly he agreed to show it. Yes, a pre-World War I chassis only, displaying its rear three-quarter elliptic springing and with a gearbox showing chassis number 1341. A sum was agreed, but the deal fell through. Whether this was indeed 1341, I know not, as it was not uncommon for the factory to use a neighbouring item during construction or later servicing. One such case was 19 PD on the gearbox, with the undertrays marked 15 BD. Abandoned and vandalised, lying in nettles and brambles in Ferring Recreation Ground near Worthing. We were alerted by Michael Wilcox of Swandine Spitfire fame. Michael said its air pump was on the gearbox, so we went over mob-handed and dismantled it into component parts loaded these into our lorry and returned to Rumsey. It went to the late Tom Brahma of Sweden, later Switzerland, and I think confused John Fessel, for the Edwardian gives both chassis in Switzerland. So little signs indicate pre-World War I chassis. After one satisfactory deal involving a 2025, our lead mentioned a farm trailer in a haulier's yard not 15 miles away, with Rolls-Royce on the hubs. Oh, written twice on each hub, I concluded. No, only once, he insisted. He was adamant. Wade and I drove up to Andover, and nearly out of town on the Way Hill Road, found two shops serving this community. A track between them led to a small, grassy haulier's yard. A sentinel steam wagon, a symphony, of steam and heat was growling quietly. Amongst the vegetation at the edge of the yard was indeed a flatbed farm trailer. Hubs, as stated, wheels tireless but beaded edge. A deal was agreed which involved the chassis only, the bed of very good timber remaining with the cheerful haulier. And WP parted with ten pounds. Severing the many retaining bolts, we lifted the bed, placing it aside to display a cantilever, wire-wheeled frame and axles. No mechanical parts or bulkhead, but the torque tube rear and lock solid front axles bore early Rudge Whitworth wheels. Not Dunlop as expected. Moving to the rear, the grasshopper springs were light and, wow, underslung. We rang for the truck from Rumsey and, with effort, loaded our prize and made good our escape. It was only back in the jam factory that I was able to inspect this more closely. 
confirmation of its dating as 17 to 1800 series was borne out by cloverleaf front spring hangers and other details verified by the 1911 parts book. The back axle was stamped 1817-1817, but as this had been a three-quarter elliptic landaulet, obviously another substitution part. Now for the cantilevers, all to be later Rolls-Royce standard, but for the main centre spring support. This, a flat plate hanger of rough-hewn appearance, was unlike any other pictured under slung in my library. All was shaped forgings, very Roycean. I wrote to Motorsport, and William Body published the letter, and in the meantime I sent the negatives to Jeremy Bacon for his then new Rolls-Royce owner magazine. Incidentally, these negatives he returned to me, upon request, in the original envelope, but 40 years later. In the meantime, Wade Palmer cleaned and primed the chassis, rebuilt the wheels, overhauled and fitted a D-rake steering column, and here is fitting an early crankcase. This publicity led to one Kenneth Neve appearing at the jam factory, and a deal was concluded, with a 1920 chassis thrown in as a donor vehicle. After many years of labour, this sterling man produced this splendid silver ghost. Only later was this farmyard trailer identified as, yes, 1701, none other than the Brooklands 101 mile an hour and London Edinburgh 1911 records holder. Later research, mainly by Tom Clark, resulted in a fine paper that investigates this fascinating subject of the first cantilever ghosts. 1700 and 1701. To conclude, a more mundane but to me no less important example. Two years after parting from Wade Palmer, I was working on the RMS Coronia as photographer when, near the end of a North Cape cruise, we called in at South Queens Ferry on the Firth of Forth. All passengers had been photographed on the quay with the imposing bridge behind and I repaired to the Halls Hotel for a well-deserved Guinness. But old habits die hard. A question re Rolls-Royce cars led me to Dundas Castle and a debris strewn, dust-covered, long unused 2025 fixed head coupe in the motor house. Here were new but by now very dishevelled. I was not in a position to rescue this fine servant of the Stuart Clark family, Rolls-Royce owners, from 60712 onwards, so I turned my back and spurned this lady. Later that summer, at a steam fair high on the downs above Winchester, I met a well-respected jack-o'-lantern customer, Captain Jeff Hall of Boak. He needed to upgrade from his Maddox 20 horsepower Doctor's Coupe. Did I know of anything? From sunny Hampshire, I recalled a faded beauty, unloved, in a mist shrouded Scottish castle. Within two days, Jeff was seated with Lady Jane Stuart Clark and, charming and twinkly as ever, had bought the car. Jeff loved it and lavished hours of care, bringing his family to many club meetings. At one, another member sent the ladies of his party to find their choice of car in the assembly. They chose GKT29. An offer was made and declined, but even so a telephone number was tendered, should you change your mind. Later, Jeff's wife needed two replacement hips. The call was made. I am very proud that Wade Palmer and I had the chance to play our part in the Rolls-Royce story. To conclude, I leave you with the Petit Derriere of GKT 
29.